Alright, we are doing chapter 11 today and if you have your textbook, please open it to page 297. 297 from your textbook. Um, just to remind you, there is a quiz on the muscles, the rest of the muscles this Tuesday. So uh, you can just come to my office and I'll give the quiz over there. And uh, also there will be a quiz next class next week on Thursday, previous chapter, chapter 10. So also when you come to my office on Tuesday, if you already read through chapter 11 or even during that week, if you need help, uh, just come over to my office or call me and I'll go over some things with you in this new chapter. Um, it's not a very difficult chapter, but you do have to spend a lot of time studying this chapter just because it's got a lot of nerve names, functions, you know, just many things to memorize. Um, that's why I also am putting this lecture online since it's more like home-based study. You could do it. it uh, it's not very difficult. So we start the chapter off uh, learning about the spinal cord. Now, if you remember from um, the chapter on bones, you've learned the vertebral column. Spinal cord goes through that vertebral column. You had a space there, right, um, uh, within the vertebral column uh, where you had the spinal cord um, attached there within the bones of the vertebral column and it sits right in there so it kind of starts off with your foramen magnum and goes all the way down to the back and um, your spinal cord is actually smaller than your vertebral column so it ends before um, the vertebral column ends. Um, you have a lot of nerves coming out from the spinal cord, which we will look at, but um, if you remember the vertebral column had all these bones, you know, paired um, bones there. We also have a um, number of paired um, spinal nerves coming out from your spinal cord as well, just like vertebral column. So you have cervical enlargement which is like an enlargement in the spinal cord and then another enlargement is lumbosacral enlargement and um, that also you see the enlargement ends um, at the tip with uh, what we call the cauda equina um, kind of looks like horse tail uh, if you look at the picture that's figure 11.1 uh, you'll see that uh, there's a picture of the spinal cord, that's what I'm looking at right now. So remember what what your spinal cord um, has, what the function is. Um, so it's a major communication, we call it link between the brain and your um, peripheral nervous system so mostly participates in the integration of incoming information and produces responses through reflex mechanisms. So you'll see that the spinal cord has these 31 pairs of spinal nerves and it's 31 because you have 8 pairs in the cervical uh, region, 12 in thoracic, 5 in lumbar, 5 in sacral and 1 in coccygeal, so when you add that it will be 31 pair. The difference with vertebral column was that you had 7 in cervical and we have 8 in um, spinal nerves. The reason is the first C1, the first bone, that bone had 2 spinal nerve coming out from there, so we have 8 uh, spinal nerves. Thoracic is still 12 for 12 um, of those spaces, so you have 12 spinal nerves there and five um, just like you had in vertebral but you have five nerves in your sacral region now remember vertebral we counted it as, as one bone just because those five of them were fused together in here even though the sacral region is fused bones they still have five 
um, nerves coming out from it. And you, you, when you look at the skeletal structure of the bones, you'll see like spaces or holes there where the nerves can uh, come out from. Coccygeal just has one, and we usually, when we denote them, write them down, we, we use um, the first letter capitalized, so if it's cervical, we say big C, uh, and number them one through eight. Uh, thoracic is a T, capital T, lumbar is a capital L, sacral, capital S, and coccygeal is a capital C with a small O, because we have cervical and coccygeal, two of them, so that's how we number them. Then we'll look at, uh, if you look at figure 11.2, in your textbook on page 299, you see there are some meningeal membranes. So in your spinal cord, um, you have the vertebral column up there and you have the spinal cord inside, which is covered by all these membranes. Um, one of the diseases you can get when it's in, you have inflammation in there, we call that meningitis. You might have heard about it. Um, that is also a disease or inflammation within this meninges. So in your spinal cord, you basically have these layers or sheets um, made out of connective tissue that covers um, areas in your spinal cord. The very outer layer, very tough outer layer is called the dura matter. The one in between, um, the second layer you could call it, is arachnoid matter. The one very close to the spinal cord that's almost touching the spinal cord is called pia matter. Pia, we use that word a lot when we mean close or attached to it. So all these three sheets of layer cover the spinal cord and between these layers we have spaces um, that contain, um, besides CSF or cerebrospinal fluid, contains other things in there. One of the space there is between the periosteum of the vertebral canal and the dura mater. So you have the dura mater, very tough outer layer, the spinal cord. Outside that you have a periosteum. In between, you have a very large space there. There We call that the epidural space. And that space, epidural space, is when um, women during childbirth usually anesthetize Aesthetics are given right in the epidural space. Just hits the place there and all the nerve endings, the roots are there, so it's very easy for the anesthetics to work. So that's your epidural space. Then you have this other space there between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. So remember the arachnoid matter is the second layer, pia matter is very much inside. So between that space we have another small space called um, your uh, subarachnoid space. It's not as big a space as the epidural space, but it's still bigger um, than your, um, what we call the subdural space. Subarachnoid space is um, used when, whenever you know, they use, um, like if you want to take cerebral spinal fluid, from your spinal cord to test for infection or something, you know, that's one place um, they take it out from because it's got a big enough space and a lot of cerebrospinal fluid in there. Um, so take a look at that picture in figure 11.2 and learn all those names, all the three layers, the spaces in between them, and um, also look at how the spinal cord is held within the vertebral column. You have what we call denticulate ligaments. You have two ligaments on one side, uh, three on top, so it really holds the spinal cord in place. So that when there's movement, um, it can, it's flexible, it can move, but it doesn't hit you know, one side to another side because that would be really bad if you think of it. So you have those ligaments to hold the spinal cord in place. Um, the spinal cord consists of a peripheral white matter and a central gray matter. So look at that picture, page 300, figure 11.3. You see the picture of the cross-section of the spinal cord there and you'll see a butterfly-like thing in the center. 
um, that's your gray matter and the white matter is rounded in the peripheral area. The white matter is organized into columns. Um, 